<laughs> Thanks, Mark. And I'm, I'm going to start by saying that I'm going to most certainly disappoint you since this is work from a little bit uh, further back than, than a few months. So uh, let me start by saying the, the following. Um, in many machine learning uh, problems, you have data sets in which each point in your data set has a geometry to it. Uh, so for example, these are uh, shapes from a data set of uh, human uh, 3D models. Uh, and then the, the data is uh, a collection of uh, 3D meshes of different subjects in different positions. And then uh, the goal is to uh, do a classification uh, in the form of uh, this is a male, this is a female, even though you have it in uh, sort of two different poses uh, and, two the, in, and two babies in sort of different poses. So you wanna be able to say baby, uh, woman, uh, male, uh, sort of independent of the pose that you're seeing. Um, here is sort of a, another type of problem where sort of the shape of your data points uh, makes, a, makes an impact that is in, in sort of important for the application. So uh, the Proton uh, Classification Benchmark Collection is a freely available data set where people test uh, machine learning um, algorithms. Uh, so in particular, uh, we're gonna be using these, uh, at least a portion of the PCB00019, where you have a bunch of proteins uh, given by the positions in R3 of the atoms. And uh, one, one, one typical task is to uh, classify the proteins according to uh, some families. Um, so that's the sort of introduction spiel that in some tasks, it is uh, important to measure the shape of the data points in a data set for, again, a particular application. Um, algebraic topology is, of course, the uh, sort of the branch of mathematics that studies shape, uh, but it does it sort of in a sort of non-rigid uh, manner. So it asks questions like, can I deform uh, this uh, disk? into something like an annulus. And by deform, I mean literally continuous deformations. Um, and what people in algebraic topology do is to try to find invariants that one can compute about spaces that can uh, help you answer these types of questions. So, so here's an example of such an invariant. Um, so for example, here are the two spaces again, the disk and the annulus, and I've triangulated them um, with some choice of vertices, edges, and, and triangular faces. Um, if you see a curve, uh, since we're in a topology talk, uh, then by curve, I really mean an, an edge. It doesn't matter if it is curved or, or straight. Um, once you have your, your space triangulated, you can compute uh, simple things like uh, the following quantity, the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. Uh, and if you do that count for these two examples, you get that for the uh, disk, you get one, and that for the annulus, you get zero. Um, it seems a little bit mysterious or at least unmotivated as to why you would like to compute something like this. Uh, but it turns out that this quantity is actually called uh, the Euler characteristics of, of a surface. Um, and something that Euler proves is that uh, if you compute the Euler characteristic of a space, that it is independent of the way you triangulate it. So if you add more vertices, more edges, and more triangles, uh, the quantity remains the same. And moreover, it is invariant under topological deformations. So um, one way to use the Euler characteristic is to, for example, take your two spaces like the disk, and the, the disk and the annulus, compute the Euler characteristics, and you can ask yourself, can I deform this guy into that guy? And since they have different Euler characteristics, the answer is no, okay? So that's what topologists do all the time. Find a simple invariant to compute and then use it to uh, distinguish between spaces. Um, here's another example of, a, of an interesting space that uh, topologists like, uh, the, the, tor the torus, the surface of a donut, essentially the circle Cartesian product with itself. Uh, another model for it is, you know, take a, a square and then identify the bottom and the top in the same direction. So you get a cylinder and identify the leftmost circle now with the rightmost circle and you recover the, the, the torus. Um, once you have the sort of the square model, Something else you can do is to triangulate it. So here is such a triangulation. And with a triangulation of the torus, you can compute its Euler characteristic to be zero. Um, so here, uh, sort of, this is a summary 
uh, free spaces, uh, their Euler characteristics computed with some triangulation that again, we know is independent. And by Euler's theorem, we know that the sphere cannot be deformed into the circle or the torus, but it doesn't tell us anything about the circle and the torus. It doesn't tell us that they're different. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment, but for now, I wanna show you an application of the Euler characteristic to a machine learning task. Uh, so here's a cool paper from uh, 2014 uh, by Richardson and, and, and Berman, um, where they use the Euler characteristic to actually distinguish between geometric uh, shapes. So here's how it goes. So they take uh, for each sort of geometric uh, shape. Uh, so this is a 3D mesh. Uh, what they do is they compute a function on the vertices of the mesh. In this case, they compute uh, curvature uh, and uh, they do the following. Uh, for various uh, threshold values, they say, okay, just give me the values of, of the mesh where the function, in this case, the curvature is above a certain threshold value, in this case, 0 0.05. And then the part of the mesh that you recover is in red here on the right-hand side. And what they do is that they compute the Euler characteristic of the set in red, and they do that for different threshold values, okay? So to summarize, geometric shape, um, function on it, real valued function on it, and then uh, Euler characteristic for the super level sets of the function for different thresholds. So um, here's a comparison of how these Euler curves look like for different uh, sort of shapes in different, uh, let's say, poses. Um, the horizontal axis is the threshold value and the vertical axis is the Euler characteristic that you get uh, when you threshold by that value. Uh, all the uh, Michaels, so this is a person, all the Michaels are in red, all the dogs are in blue and all the horses are in uh, green. So you can use these curves as signatures to classify these 3D shapes. And here are some of the results that they present. So you get pretty high accuracy with a very simple topological invariant, the, uh, the Euler characteristic or the Euler curve. And the way you, you do it in, 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 sort of in, in real life is by taking sort of this multi-scale approach uh, combined with a topological feature. So this is gonna be the sort of the theme of the, of the talk. It's gonna be sort of a topological descriptor in a multi-scale fashion for classification and machine learning tasks. Um, a quick question on that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, figure. Was that a two-dimensional simplex? Um, yeah, so it's a, three, it's a two-dimensional, sim yeah, exactly. So a two-dimensional simplicial complex, you have vertices, edges, and triangular faces. And then from there, in, from each one of those, you compute the, the Euler characteristic for a certain uh, sort of subset of that, given by the threshold value. Okay, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, cool. So um, as we saw a, a little bit uh, earlier, uh, the Euler characteristic is just not powerful enough to distinguish sort of even spaces that ought to be different, like the circle and the, and the torus. Uh, like the torus is something two-dimensional, you know, it ought to be different from the circle, at least topologically. Um, so, so here's something else that topologists compute. Um, it's called the Betty numbers of, of a space. Um, and what it captures is the number of holes in different dimensions that the space has. Um, let me just go through these slowly and, and, and hopefully it'll make sense as I go through. Um, so uh, Betty zero, so for n equals to, to so for n equal to zero, measures the number of zero dimensional holes. So what is a zero dimensional hole? It's a connected component. In other, in other words, Betty zero measures the number of connected components that your space has. Uh, the sphere is connected, therefore Betty zero is equal to one. Uh, similarly, the torus is also connected. So Betty zero is equal to one. Again, one connected component. Now, Betty one measures the number of one dimensional holes in the space. What is a one dimensional hole? It is a closed curve 
that doesn't bound a two-dimensional piece of the space. So it's a hole, a hole in the space. So notice that anytime I draw a closed curve on the sphere, there is always a two-dimensional cap bounded by that curve. So that means that the sphere doesn't have one dimensional holes. The torus on the other hand has essentially two different one dimensional holes. One of them is the horizontal direction and the other one is the vertical direction. So if you draw the, the closed curve here in the, in the horizontal direction, uh, there is sort of nothing inside it. Uh, Betty two again, uh, measures the number of two dimensional holes in the space. Uh, so by, so we, if, if one dimension is curves, then two dimensional is surfaces. Uh, the sphere itself is a closed surface that bounds sort of a three dimensional void. And that's why Betty two of the sphere is equal to one. Uh, similarly, Betty two of the torus is equal to one because the torus itself is a closed two dimensional surface that bounds a three dimensional void in the middle, okay? Uh, and then the, the, the theorem that one can prove is that in fact, the Euler characteristic is the uh, alternating sum of the Betty numbers. So in that sense, the Betty numbers are a bigger invariant than the Euler characteristic uh, because one can get the Euler characteristic from the Betty numbers. The Betty numbers are also invariant under topological deformations. And for example, it tells us that the sphere now is clearly different from the, from the torus. Um, and moreover, it now allows you to uh, distinguish between spaces like the circle and the, and, and the torus, which were before sort of unclear because the order okay. characteristic gave you the same answer. Sorry. I, I think somebody has their mic on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's, there's, I, I hear I, I hear Portuguese in the background. Um, indeed. We'll, we'll 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 move on. So the whole point of these of this slide is just to say that uh, even though the Euler characteristic might not be enough to distinguish certain spaces, the Betty numbers now give you a little bit of an oomph because they can now distinguish between things that were not clear before. Um, okay, so now let me go back to the, to the world of data, which is perhaps what people care about in this, in this audience. And in particular, this idea of persistent homology. Um, so here's a data set, uh, just a collection of points, some finite metric space. Um, and again, if you look at it on the plane, it looks like it has some sort of circular pattern, but if you go ahead and compute on the nose, things like the Betty numbers, you will get that Betty zero, the number of connected components in this case will be the number of points. And that Betty one, which is supposed to capture sort of holes or one dimensional uh, holes in the data in, in, in the space is zero. And, and the reason is because even though the data sort of arranges itself around a circular shape, uh, the space is completely disconnected. There's no closed curve that you can draw. Um, so how do you adapt this type of topological invariance to, to discrete data sets, to just collections of points. I mean, you do the, the obvious thing, right? You, you take your, your points and you start drawing edges between things that are close by, and then you start increasing the uh, reach as to where you draw things. And every time you draw, let's say a triangle with your edges, you fill it in with a two dimensional face Every time you draw edges between four points, you draw the three-dimensional tetrahedron and so on. And then the idea is that throughout that process, you are capturing the underlying shape of the object. So just to see it one more time, when the, when the scale, when the epsilon of, connect, of connecting your data points is very small, everything is disconnected, but at some point, sort of the, the, the simplicial complex, the triangulation you get sort of reflects the underlying shape of the data. So that's the, the game we're gonna play. Um, so um, the, the main sort of vehicle to go from, from data to, to something that we can compute topological invariance of 
is this idea of computing uh, sort of spaces or simplicial complexes of different scales using connectivity predicates, okay? So now that we have these uh, spaces, we can compute, as I said, topological invariance. In this case, we're gonna compute the homology of the space. Um, uh, if, you don't know, if you don't know what that is, uh, the homology uh, of, a, of a space is a collection of vector spaces in this case uh, over a field F. Um, and what one can show is that with sort of, uh, with some care is that the dimension of these vector spaces recovers the Betty numbers. Uh, so in a sense, this uh, vector space is a bigger invariant than the Betty numbers in that it's a vector space, right? It's bigger than a number. Um, and its dimension captures the number of holes in the, in the space. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna compute uh, at least uh, the first homology of each one of these three simplicial complexes here on the screen. So if you look at the, if you look at K zero, um, maybe it is hard to see, but here in the upper right, there is a little hole uh, in, the, in the space that I've created. Um, so the dimension of H1 would be one because of this little hole. Uh, similarly in K1, uh, you will see now in the lower left that there is this sort of hole in the space and that is captured by uh, H1 being one dimensional. Um, and in K2, uh, K2 itself now recovers sort of the circular shape and its dimension is one. Again, this F is, is capturing this, this circle. Um, the thing to note is, is that when you go from K0 to K1, the hole in the upper right is filled in. So one can encode that idea by saying that in going from K0 to K1, the hole represented by this part, by this copy of the field goes to uh, zero. And similarly, when you go from K1 to K2, the hole that you have in the lower left is filled in in K2. So that copy of the field goes to zero in K2. Um, so let's put everything together. Um, again, when you have a data set, what we do in, in sort of applied topology is to construct these families of simplicial complexes that uh, capture the underlying topology. Um, we do that by taking all the, all the scales at once, instead of trying to find a, an optimal scale because that problem is just ill-defined. So you look at all scales at once, and from each scale you compute homology, which is again, this vector space whose dimension measures the number of holes in dimension n for your, for your uh, simplicial complex, for your k. Um, and then the thing that I want to uh, sort of bring your attention to is that every time you have a, a vector space, of course, you have a basis. Um, everything is finite in this case because we're in you know, data analysis type of environment. Um, but not only do you have um, vector spaces and, and bases, um, these complexes are related to each other, right? So K0 is contained in K1, K1 is contained in K2 and so on. And therefore you have not only vector spaces but also linear transformations between them, okay? So this is the, this is the idea of persistent homology is that to compute the homology of data, the thing to do is to construct this sort of multi-scale representation of it and then see how the homology changes across scales by tracking how sort of good choices of bases behave. Let me explain that last point. So if you have a linear transformation in between two vector spaces and you have a basis for them, of course you have a matrix representation. Now, if you do Gaussian elimination or just simple Gaussian elimination, then of course you can turn it into a very simple matrix with zeros and ones. Um, notice how I went from purple to, to blue in my change of basis for the Gaussian elimination process. Um, now, another way to interpret this matrix is just by saying that the first basis element goes to the first basis element in this other vector space. The second basis, basis element goes to this other basis element. And then the third basis element goes to zero, right? So uh, I've, I've changed this matrix by just this collection of arrows. Um, what one can show is that not only, I mean, Gaussian elimination tells you that every time you have two vector spaces, there is a choice of bases that does that. Uh, what one can show is that if you have a family of vector spaces, then you can do that sort of all at once, 
right? You can choose bases consistently across all these vector spaces in such a way that uh, one um, basis element goes to another basis element or goes to zero. Uh, notice that it's, I'm not saying that a basis element goes to a linear combination of the others, that is trivial. I'm saying a basis element goes on the nose to another basis element or to zero and there are no clashes, okay? So um, there's this very cool paper from a while ago, Computing Persistent Homology, showing that the computation of sort of the consistent computation of all these bases is actually essentially computing the Smith normal form of some matrix. Um, and therefore one can implement uh, actual algorithms computing uh, sort of these representations. So to summarize, um, if you have a, a, a space like a torus, you can triangulate it and compute things like Betty numbers, which tell you the number of holes in each dimension. Um, if you now take a sample, a random sample from a space like the torus, you get a point cloud like the one that is on the lower left. And if you wanted to recover the underlying topology of the space that underlies it, then you play the game that I just outlined. Uh, look at the collection of points in a multi-scale fashion by computing simplicial complexes at several scales, and then track how the homology changes by sort of tracking good choices of bases. And what you get is the sort of representation that we call the barcode that essentially has these horizontal lines, which essentially, which represent basis elements in the homology being put in correspondence across scales. Um, the way we typically read these barcodes is by saying that if you have a very long bar, then there is a topological feature that survives a large chunk of the scale. So you treat it as a, like a real feature, a real topological feature underlying the data. And then smaller bars are sort of these features that come and go as you change the scale parameter. What I want you to notice now is that if you look at the Betty numbers, one to one, uh, that is reflected in the number of long bars in each one of the barcodes. So barcode in dimension zero has one long bar that is consistent with Betty zero being one, which again means that the torus is connected. Betty one, the barcode in dimension one has sort of two long intervals, which is consistent with Betty one of the torus being two, which again is saying that has two, two one dimensional holes and the same for uh, the barcode in dimension two. Uh, and again, we have sort of uh, polynomial time algorithms for computing these barcodes from, from uh, data. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, I will be happy to take them. <clears throat> yeah, if uh, any questions come up during the talk as well, feel free to put them in the chat or to just interrupt Jose as, as he's talking as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's plow ahead. So, um, so I've told you the story of sort of barcodes as a way to uh, quantify the underlying topology of data in a way to tell you sort of what is the likely topology of the space from which the data was sampled. Uh, if you care about uh, sort of manifold learning, you can see, for example, how you can use this, right? Um, now, um, another representation of, of the barcode that is also useful to have is the persistence diagram. So that's, the, that's part of the title of the talk. So if you have a barcode, which is just this collection of intervals, as I mentioned before, you can just take the endpoints of all the intervals and plot them in the X, Y axis, right? So for example, this bar starts at B, ends at D. You can replace that by a point of coordinates B comma D. And if you do that for each one of the bars, you get a collection of points above the diagonal in R2 that we call the persistence diagram. Um, one thing to note is that uh, you can have intervals, uh, several intervals with the same endpoints. So uh, the persistence diagram is actually a multi-set in the sense that points can come with repetitions. Um, again, the way to read this is saying that uh, the topological feature is born in the X coordinate uh, the Y coordinate D captures where the topological feature dies. The topological feature, I mean, captured by this uh, dot or by the or by the corresponding interval, and the uh, sort of vertical distance to the diagonal captures the length of the interval, 
or the persistence of the feature. Um, the reason why I mention the, the persistence diagram as, a, as an alternative to the barcode is because uh, there are good sort of statistics uh, on, on, on persistence diagrams that are harder to interpret for barcodes. Let me uh, explain what I mean by that. So here are two data sets. Um, one, so both are sampled around the unit circle in R2, uh, one in uh, sort of black uh, asterisks and uh, the other one in, in blue dots. Um, so one is sort of a noisy version of the other. Um, if you compute the, the barcodes for both data sets in dimensions uh, zero and one, you will see that um, the, the barcodes you get are similar, right? So uh, again, the blue dots correspond to the barcode for the blue data set and the asterisks correspond to the asterisk data set. Um, in particular, I want you to sort of draw your attention to the, the thing on the right. This is the barcode in dimension, sorry, the persistence diagram in dimension one. And since you have sort of this one relevant feature here very far from the diagonal, then you say that the data has a one dimensional hole that underlies it. And that is true. But the main point is that, that I want to sort of uh, outline here is that if you perturb your data a little bit, the idea should be that the persistence diagrams would get perturbed a little bit. In other words, that this descriptor is uh, stable. And that's the thing I want to outline uh, as, we, as we go along. So um, what do I mean by, by stable? Um, so suppose you have some ambient metric space, which is where your data lives, maybe Euclidean space or a manifold, and you have two data sets X and Y contained in M. So uh, one way to measure the similarity between two data sets or between two finite metric spaces is using the Hausdorff distance, right? So the Hausdorff distance between two uh, compact metric spaces, uh, sub, sort of compact subsets of a, of a metric space uh, is the following uh, formula. You take the infimum over all epsilons such that you can include uh, the second metric space into the union of uh, epsilon balls centered at points in X. And you can also include X into the union of balls of radius epsilon centered at points in Y. Um, maybe a picture is uh, better than this uh, formula. Uh, the idea of the, of the Hausdorff distance is, uh, is the following. You take, let's say your blue data set and you ask how much do I have to thicken it to include the, the white data set. So in this case, you get this epsilon, maybe 0 0.14 or something. And then you ask the same question for the asterisk data set. How much do I have to thicken it to include all the, all the blue data? And the Hausdorff distance is the biggest of the two. Okay. Um, so this is, again, one way to measure how uh, far from uh, sort of being isometric uh, for, for, for two uh, compact sets in a, in a metric space. Um, the bottleneck distance is a way of also measuring of, of measuring similarities between persistence diagrams. Remember that um, the Hausdorff distance gives you a way to measure similarity between data sets or compact subsets of a metric space. And then what I'm what I want to say next is that there is a way to also measure similarity between persistence diagram, and that similarity is called the bottleneck distance. So again, here are the one-dimensional uh, persistence diagrams of the two data sets. Um, a matching between these two persistence diagrams is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you pair points in the asterisk diagram with points in the blue diagram and points that are left unmatched, you pair them with the diagonal, okay? And then the cost of uh, each matching is essentially the L infinity distance between any two matched points. And then what you do is you look at the worst, the worst, the highest cost you're paying with this uh, match, okay? So that is the cost of the matching, is the, is the worst you're doing by, by, by pairing points either blue to, to asterisk or leftover point to diagonal. 
um, here's a better matching in the sense that it has lower cost um, because again, is the, is the L infinity distance between points that are matched. And then the bottleneck distance between persistence diagrams is defined as the cost of the best matching. So if you're familiar with Wasserstein distances from maybe statistics or, 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 or um, optimal transport, then this is like an L infinity type Wasserstein distance between uh, these two multisets. So the, the, the stability theorem for persistence diagrams is this very simple inequality. It says that the bottleneck distance between uh, the persistence diagram from two data sets is bounded from above by twice the Hausdorff distance, right? So, uh, it's very, so, so it says that these persistence diagrams are a very stable invariant in, in the sense that they're just bounded from above by a constant times the Hausdorff distance. Remember that the bottleneck distance on the left is the cost of the, of the best matching and the Hausdorff distance on the right is how much do you have to thicken one space to include the other and vice versa. Um, so that's the stability Question of the- Question on that. Yeah, go ahead. Is that inequality like optimal or tight or? It is, it is. Um, let me say let me say one word about that though. Um, here I'm using the Hausdorff distance between these because these two metric spaces are subsets of the same metric space. If you didn't have that, you would use the Gromov Hausdorff distance, which not only infimizes on epsilon, but also infimizes on the isometric embeddings of X and Y into common metric spaces. Um, but yeah, this constant is optimal. Um, so to, to bring everything together, um, what I said at the beginning of the talk is that in some data analysis tasks like protein classification, each data point has a geometry and a shape to it uh, that is useful to, 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 to sort of quantify. Um, I've told you how persistence diagrams are able to capture shape. Uh, so they are sort of this multi-scale summary of how the topology changes in the, in the data. And the last point is that this is a sort of a stable invariant in the, in the Gromov Hausdorff sense. Okay. Um, so what I wanna transition to now is how to use these persistence diagrams in tasks like uh, supervised learning, uh, particularly when you want to have invariants, you want to have features that are invariant to uh, let's say isometries um, and other types of, of deformations. So one of the sort of most sort of simple minded strategies for doing machine learning with persistence diagrams comes from work of all these people, the sort of the Colorado State team. Uh, so they call these the persistent images and it's just a very simple though very useful idea. So, so what, is the, what is the plan? The plan is you take your data, um, you turn it into a persistence diagram through means similar to what I've shown you. Um, another type of visualization that is, that is used in practice is instead of looking at the, let's say wedge, sort of points above the diagonal, you can just do a linear transformation to turn this into something looking like a square. Uh, so maybe you do, instead of doing birth versus death, you do birth versus persistence, which is death minus birth. Um, so what you do then is you take these points and you treat them as a, maybe as a point process or as a random sample. And there is sort of an underlying density function to it, which you can discretize into images and treat the image, the, the sort of the resulting image as a, as a feature vector, right? So the, the, the whole pipeline is take your data, turn it into a topological summary like the persistence diagram. And then from that summary, construct some vectors or, or, or features that uh, sort of capture the, the diagram in some sense. Okay, and this has been very, very useful. Um, for example, um, one, of the, one of the sort of cool applications of, of this idea is to uh, sort of making predictions 
in, 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 in sort of drug design and in, 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 in biochemical applications. Uh, so this is work of, of Guo Wei and, and in his group at, at Michigan State. So what they do is that they turn, so they, they, they take sort of molecules, uh, compute uh, persistence diagram summaries, and then after some vectorization, like the persistent images, they're able to feed it into sort of deep uh, networks uh, to make predictions. Uh, so for example, uh, they can uh, sort of predict uh, mutations uh, or, or site of, of bi or binding sites uh, from sort of, sort of these topological summaries and sort of neural network uh, predictors. And what they've shown is that this is actually very, very, very successful. So they've been at the, they've been at the top of these sort of uh, sort of drug discovery challenges for the last few years. Um, so my, my, my argument thus far is that persistence diagrams are a useful um, descriptor of shape for data. And that in some cases they give you sort of the state of the art performance in these sort of uh, biochemical inspired challenges. Um, the theory though is sparse. The theory of, of, of learning classifiers on persistence diagrams is rather sparse. And so that is part of the work I've been involved in for the last uh, couple of years. So sort of putting some math to the question of approximating continuous functions on persistence diagrams um, using labeled data. Uh, you can find this work on, on the archive. Um, so what is the, what is the idea? Um, as I said before, a persistence diagram is a descriptor of sort of multi-scale topology for data. Um, and they live as just collections of points in the wedge, which is just the pairs of, of points x, y in R2, such that x is less than y and everything is uh, greater than or equal to zero. Um, a persistence diagram, just to remind you, uh, can be thought of as uh, the set of points, of course, their locations in the wedge, but also they also come with multiplicities because remember that a topological feature can sort of, you can have several topological features that appear at the same time and end at the same time. So points can come with multiplicities. Uh, D0 is now the space of all finite diagrams. By finite, I mean that they have finally many points here in the wedge. And then for to do the, to, to have the, the math be sort of a little bit nicer, we completed to the, to the space of generalized persistence diagrams, which is just a metric completion using the bottleneck distance. Um, so now you have a complete uh, separable metric space, the, the space of generalized persistence diagrams with the bottleneck distance. And uh, one can actually describe D fairly simply. So what it is, is the collection of all diagrams, so collections of points in the wedge with multiplicity, such that every time you fix an epsilon diagonal, the number of points above that diagonal is always finite, okay? So no matter where you put your epsilon, the number of points above that diagonal is always finite. That is what D turns out to be, okay? So it's, it's, like, it's like diagrams that are finite above every epsilon diagonal. So what is the problem at hand? Again, if you're thinking of putting math to the problem of supervised learning, uh, is given sort of an arbitrary continuous function, you can think of this as your classifier. You want to approximate it arbitrarily well in a computationally feasible manner. And what do I mean by well? Uh, you have to say with respect to some topology. Uh, the, the topology that turns out to be useful in the, in the space of continuous functions from D to R is the compact open topology, sort of the, the, the topology of convergence on compact sets. And, and the reason is because this space D is uh, sort of unwieldy. So even though it is sort of a complete separable metric space, um, it, is, it, is, it is difficult in terms of statistics. So for example, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously, it is obviously not a vector space. So, so doing things like computing means, averages is difficult. Uh, so this, the other thing is that this space is sort of rather large. So restricting yourself to compact sets seems to be a, a reasonable uh, sort of reduction. Um, 
So the first thing I want to do in this last part of the talk is, is the following. I want to tell you what are the compact subsets of deep. So how does compactness uh, look like in the space of generalized persistence diagrams? And then I want to give you a sort of storm by air stress type of theorem where, where, where we tell you how to do approximation of any continuous function in the space of persistence diagrams. Uh, once I do that, I'll show you some examples where we actually apply that to supervised learning tasks. A question so, on that slide. Yeah, go ahead. So D are the diagrams and then F would be basically the neural network, right? For example, yeah, yeah. Or log, yeah, like a logistic regression kind of thing where it tells you, you know, these diagrams are labeled one, these diagrams are labeled zero. Okay, and you want to approximate this function in some other way, non neural so, network way. Okay, so so maybe 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 I should be a little bit more clear. So I, I'm thinking of big F as the ground truth, the thing that you do not have access to, but maybe you have you have some samples of it, right? So you have some diagrams and you have the labels for those diagrams. What I want to do is to recover or at least approximate the ground truth F as closely as possible. For example, with a neural network or with other type of function. Okay. Does that, does that answer the, the, the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so, um, so the first thing I wanna say is sort of what, is, what does compactness look like in the, in the space of generalized persistence diagrams? Um, so this is like a, like a hain borel type of theorem. So, um, so the, the first thing to, to note is, is, is sort of this very simple example. So um, what I'm gonna do, what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm constructing a sequence of diagrams. Each diagram, dn has a single point. The point is located at coordinates one comma n for each natural number n. And the multiplicity of that point is just one. Right? So I have a sequence of diagrams and the diagrams just have one point and the point is just moving up and up and up. If you compute the bottleneck distance between diagrams in the sequence, uh, perhaps you can convince yourself that the, that the cost of the best matching is something that, that looks like n minus m. Right? It's just it's the distance between the points that you have matched in the L infinity sense. Um, sort of an obvious uh, sort of consequence of this calculation is that the sequence has no convergent subsequences. So if you want to think about compactness in the space of generalized persistence diagrams, then in particular, you cannot go off in the vertical direction. So if you want boundedness, you at least have to be, if you, if you want compactness, you at least have to be bounded. I mean, that is true in any metric space, but nonetheless, it's useful to have explicitly here. So what it says is that uh, you know you want sort of a, an upper boundary uh, to where you can go. Uh, here's another example. Uh, again, a sequence of diagrams. The diagrams have exactly one point. That point has multiplicity one. But now the points are just moving along this diagonal. The diagonal is, of, uh, is shifted one. Um, again, you can compute the bottleneck distance with something like this, where this is the, the delta in M. Uh, it is one if N is equal to M, zero if not. Um, and again, you can, you can the, the, sort of the, the conclusion is that this has no convergence of sequences. So again, if you want compactness, you better sort of, you, you have to somehow bound from the right. You cannot let your points just go off to infinity away from the diagonal. So uh, there is this concept that we call of diagonally birth bounded that says that um, every time um, that if you want to go off to infinity, you have to get closer and closer to the diagonal. It cannot be sort of bounded away from the, from the diagonal arbitrary. And then the last example is, is the following. Each diagram has exactly one coordinate, one comma two, but the multiplicity of that point is increasing. So the first diagram has only one point in that coordinate. The second diagram has two points, three, and so on. Uh, again, one can check that the bottleneck distance looks like that. 
and therefore it doesn't have convergence of sequences. Um, so again, if you want compactness, you better control your multiplicity. You cannot just let it go off to infinity um, unchecked. Um, so the last condition, and I don't, you know, it's the, maybe it's not that important what this means, it's just the, the intuition that if you're away from the diagonal, your multiplicity cannot be unbounded. Um, what we prove is that a subset of the space of generalized persistence diagrams is relative, com relatively compact, meaning that its closure is compact, if and only if it is bounded of diagonally birth bounded, meaning it cannot go off to the right away from the diagonal and uniformly, uniformly of diagonally finite. The multiplicity cannot go unchecked away from the diagonal. Um, again, uh, not as important what these conditions are right now, but just to tell you that we have a very clear handle on what compactness looks like in the space of persistence diagrams. Uh, here are some consequences. Uh, in particular, all compact subsets of D have empty interior. That's a bummer. There are no compact neighborhoods. Um, using that D is complete, this means that one cannot write it as a union of countably many compact sets. Uh, so that, that says that if you want to break your, your problem into compact regions, maybe because you're doing something like gradient descent uh, and, and you, and you want to be in a compact set, uh, this space is just too unwieldy to, to, to do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a countable manner. And then one consequence of these two facts is that the compact open topology in here is not metrizable. So there are no sort of metric based sort of uh, penalty functions that you can put to do uh, supervised learning in here with the compact open topology. Um, so after sort of all that bad news, uh, peppered with some good news of that we know what is bad about it. Uh, I can now tell you what we actually do to do approximations in the space of continuous functions from D to R. In other words, how do we find uh, sort of good features? Yes, Mark? I have a, a, a stupid question because it's what I do. Um, uh, this depends on the particular choice of metric that you're using, right? The bottleneck metric. The bottleneck distance, correct, yeah. yeah or can't you, um, or is it possible that you could replace that with something that behaves somewhat similarly and get much better? Uh, um, maybe, but there is actually a good reason for choosing the bottleneck distance as the, like the de facto metric. So there is another theorem called the isometry theorem that, that says that the bottleneck distance is sort of the best choice that there is to capture the geometry of the space of persistence diagrams. Um, there are other things that you can do ad hoc, uh, but this is like a principal choice and turns out to be difficult to deal with. Yeah. That's just like the nature of the beast. Yeah, yeah. Given that the space is compact though, it seems like anything that's sort of comparable um, mm -hmm. would and allows you to have uh, compact subsets that are a little bit nicer. Yeah. Could, well. Yeah. No, but it it'll it'll it is, it's sort of the law of of no free lunch, right? Like if you can fix that thing, something else will go wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's just it, it is what it is. I feel you, and we'll just plow ahead. That's that's yeah. that's okay. that's what we do. Okay. Right. I was just wondering. Thanks. Yeah. No. No. But that's a great question. Yeah. There. Are, there. Are, I mean, you're, the answer to that is yes. There are other distances. That one can impose the bottleneck distance has theoretical properties. Why this uh like like the like the natural choice for distance on the space? It is difficult to deal with because the space is complicated. Other choices will have difficulties somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a follow up question, um, uh, Wesley. Mm -hmm. You want to unmute yourself and ask? Or. Okay, all right, so let me, uh, can't unmute, so I'll just read it to you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Wesley asks, any idea or insight of what D might look like if you define it as the completion of D zero with respect to a Q Wasserstein norm versus bottleneck? Yeah, yeah, it looks like an LQ space. It looks like an LQ space with a Wasserstein distance, right? So, so, so instead of having these um, condition that away from the, uh, above an epsilon diagonal, you're finite, it says that above your epsilon diagonal, you have, above the diagonal, you have finite, like an LQ norm. Okay. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's essentially like an LQ space. 
That sounds like Great it question. might be nicer in some ways, I guess, but yeah, okay. It is, it, it has it has some nice properties, but then the stability is is not as clear. Okay, all right. So you remember the stability, this, this stability theorem that says that the bottleneck distance is bounded by the Hausdorff distance. When you put these other Q Wasserstein distances, that theorem degrades a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop bothering you about it now. <laughs> no, great. Great questions. Okay. So going back to this idea of approximating continuous functions on the space of persistence diagrams, just to remind you what the context is. Um, the problem is we have this sort of ground truth that we don't have access to, but we have samples from it, and we want to approximate it using the compact open topology, which is non-metrizable, as we know. Um, uh, so what we, what we do is we use this idea of templates, and this is close to what people in like wavelets do all the time. So what is the idea? So a template is just going to be a compactly supported continuous function on the wedge, right? So it's a continuous map from the wedge to the reals, and its support is entirely contained in W, and it is compact, OK? So the, the thing to, to notice is that if you look at the function that takes a diagram, so fix, fix your f, your little f, your template. The function uh, new sub f that takes a diagram and just take the sums of the values of f on the points that fall in its uh, uh, support, right? So this gives you a real number then this function is continuous for every uh, f, for every choice of f in, in, in compactly supported functions, right? So um, the, I guess the way to, to, to think about this, or at least one way to think about this is that you're sort of turning your diagram into a measure by putting delta, direct deltas on the points of the diagram and you're essentially just integrating integrating against f. That's all it is. And of course, that has to be continuous. So, so here's the, the theorem we, we prove. Um, so we prove that if you take a compact subset of the space of persistence diagrams, and you have your sort of ground truth in, the, in, in, in that compact set, which again, remember that we know exactly what it is, um, then given any epsilon, so this is going to be the threshold for your approximation, there are template functions f1 through fn. There exist template functions f1 through fn and a polynomial in n variables so that every time you evaluate the polynomial on these real numbers, uh, that is sort of epsilon away from, from the ground truth f. Again, just let's try to digest what this is saying. So take your template function f1, for example. Okay, so remember that the function nu f1 is essentially for every diagram D, you are sort of evaluating the function f on the points of D. So that gives you a real number. And f1 through fn, so that gives you n real numbers. You plug them into the polynomial P of n variables. This is another real number. And what I'm saying is that, that the result that you're getting is, all, is gonna be epsilon close to the ground truth f for appropriate f1 through fn and appropriate polynomial p, okay? So in other words, uh, what I'm saying is that this set of functions given by templates and polynomials is compact, open, dense in the space of all continuous functions on the on persistence diagrams, okay? So this is a, this is like a, like a stone by Erstras kind of approximation theorem. Um, it doesn't tell you how to find the f's, it doesn't tell you how to find the n. It doesn't tell you how to find the p, but there exist. So that gives you some, some warmth and, and comfort. Um, what we do in practice uh, is that we, we try to find the supports of the f1 through fn adaptively, like in, like in wavelet analysis, we, we pick a single f and we move it around by dilating and translating its support. And, uh, and once you have the sort of some good choice of f's, the polynomial can be found with some sort of linear uh, regression uh, if you have labeled data. So that's the, that's the whole game. You, you find your F1 through Fn uh, with some sort of adaptive procedure that 
has no guarantees, but some heuristics. Uh, and then you find the coefficients of the polynomial with some sort of linear regression. And that gives you, in theory, a good approximation to, 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 to the ground truth in the compact open topology. So I'm gonna end with a few examples of these applied to real data, and then we'll just go on our, on our merry ways. Um, so, so here's an example from uh, maybe dynamical systems. Um, you have uh, the Rosler attractor, which uh, is sort of what you get when you solve this system of equations for different uh, parameters A, B, and C. So on the left-hand side, you have a periodic orbit of the, of the system. And on the right, you have a chaotic, uh, a chaotic uh, attractor from the system. Um, and then what you can try to do is, um, or, or at least what the, what the, the experiment I'm, I'm going to uh, describe is, you know, imagine sampling the attractor for several parameters A, B, and C, and trying to determine, is it chaotic? Is it periodic? Right. So if we if we watch them with our eyes, of course, it's very simple, saying that this looks like a periodic orbit, and at least this looks like a um, like a um, um, chaotic attractor. Uh, but if you want to sort of construct features to do machine learning on these type of data sets, uh, then you have to somehow capture the shape of the of each one of these attractors, and that's exactly what we do, right? So we compute we for 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 several choices of A, B, and C. Uh, we compute the corresponding attractors, we compute persistence diagrams to capture the shape of the attractor, and then we just run sort of this template business to train a classifier to tell you, do you have something periodic? Do you have something chaotic? Um, so here are some of the results. Um, this is, this alpha, this horizontal axis is a, uh, something that depends on A, B, and C. There are some dependencies on, between A, B, and C. Uh, but the thing that I want to just uh, draw your attention to is that the sort of triangles and dots are the places or the values of alpha uh, for which we made errors in our classifier. Um, so everything you see in dark blue were sort of correct uh, classification for, for is it periodic, is it uh, um, chaotic? And then the, the triangles and the dots were sort of combinations of the parameters where we made mistakes. And they happen sort of at, the, at these boundaries between sort of uh, periodic and, and, and uh, chaotic. Um, uh, here's another uh, dynamical system, the Kuramoto Shibashinsky. Perhaps I'm going to skip this um, to go, yeah, to just sort of uh, give you the sort of last couple of examples and tell you how we actually find the templates. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, imagine that you have a collection of persistence diagrams and you have labels for them. So in this case, the, the, the color, so each, each color is a different diagram and the color is the label, right? So think of MNIST. Um, so what we do is we, uh, we find sort of the regions that are best attuned to each class by doing things like Gaussian mixture models or clustering. Uh, if you want to know more about the, the methods that we use to find sort of these regions, you can look at, at this paper. Um, but this at least gives you the supports of regions that will be good at separating classes uh, represented by these persistence diagrams. Um, so when we apply this technology to, for example, the data set of shapes, um, we get uh, sort of uh, classification accuracy in the sort of 90th percent uh, when, we, when, we, when we wanna classify is the shape uh, uh, a male, a female, or a baby. And again, the input is 3D mesh. We compute persistence diagrams from it and then do classification using these template functions. And in this case, we used uh, SVM, just a, sing a simple uh, supported vector machine on the, on the sort of template features. Um, the last data set I want to describe is this uh, protein classification benchmark uh, data set that I started with. Um, so it's a collection of uh, uh, 1300 proteins, and then each protein is represented by its atoms in R3. Uh, you have proteins that have between 1000 and 2000 atoms. And we just look at that 
collection of points in R3, right? So take a protein, look at its atoms, that gives you a collection of points in R3, and then we represent that collection of points in R3 via a persistence diagram. And we use those persistence diagrams across 55 different classification tasks that depend sort of on, on, on what the proteins are representing. Um, so here are some examples of the persistence diagrams that you get from, from particular proteins. And what we show is that uh, we get upwards of 98% average classification accuracy across these 55 different uh, sort of protein classification tasks. Uh, and this improves over a previous paper that used sort of handcrafted features and got something close to 82% classification accuracy. Uh, again, by, by picking features that were sort of biochemically reasonable. Uh, and what we show is that by just using these um, just sort of automatic uh, sort of uh, region detection and then template features, um, we get high accuracy in, a, across all these classification tasks. Uh, so this is all I wanted to, to say. Um, here are some papers that, uh, that say a little bit more of the, of the details. Um, the, the message of the, of the talk is that um, sometimes it is useful to capture the shape of the points in a data set and that you can do that with persistence diagrams and that now we have uh, theory and algorithms for doing um, uh, classification uh, with uh, those features. That's it. Excellent. Uh, thanks a lot. Hold on, my, my audio is freaking out again. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, uh, so, okay, so um, what I can do is I, I, I can leave, come back in just 30 seconds, and then the audio will be okay. Is that <laughs> fine, Mark? Sure, sure. Give me 